We have Lauren. How long have you been playing for, Lauren? I've been playing since the summer. Okay. And Lauren was is a former college tennis player at Winona State. Um, yeah, so coming over from tennis to pickleball, very similar to what I did. And so I'm guessing some of the stuff that we're going to work on is maybe some of the smaller, intricate differences between tennis and, and pickleball. The nice part is coming from tennis, you have a, a great background, general understanding. I'm going to tell you some things that are a little bit counterintuitive coming from tennis to pickleball, but this is all stuff that I kind of wish that I knew or somebody that could, could have told me this when I started playing pickleball. When I started, when I first picked it up, I picked up the paddle with a semi-western grip and I hit my first dink like that, uh, trying to put a whole bunch of topspin on it. Uh, learn quick th that way, but is there anything in particular that you want to, to work on in your game? Um, just kind of like what you said, working on the pickleball specifics, so like the dink and the third shot drop, so. Okay, sure, yeah, perfect. Let's do it. All right, let's do it, Lauren. All right, so one of the first things that, that I see is, first off, I love that you have a two-handed backhand. Um, believe it or not, until probably like two years ago, you were crazy if you had a two-handed backhand in, in pickleball. But uh, about two years ago, the Newmans, Riley and Lindsay Newman started playing. They came out with a, and they were hitting two-handed backhands. I'm like, that makes so much sense. Why is everybody doing it one-handed? So don't ever let anybody tell you the two-hand is wrong. But one hand is also important because one of the reasons why Riley Newman can use two hands is because he's so freaking athletic, he can get to everything with two hands. The problem with two hands sometimes is we don't have quite as much reach. So I want you to stand right on that kitchen line and I want you to reach as far towards me as you can with two hands and now one hand, right? you have a little bit extra reach, especially when you're moving this direction, right? We have more reach with one. So it's important to have, have both. Um, so I wanna do a few dinks with you one-handed, just, just to see what that technique looks like. Oops. The only thing that I'm seeing on this one-hander is you have a pretty flat stroke, okay. meaning like your swing path is very linear. It's on one sort of one plane. And you're hitting it really, really low over the net, which is good. You want to keep your, your dink down low. Sometimes my guess would be you hit that ball a little bit too far and then your opponent can smack it at you, right? So I want to see you get that paddle instead of directly behind the ball, a little bit further below the ball. Your follow through should end up a little bit higher than your backswing, right? So instead of swinging flat here, we should come upwards just a little bit. And that's going to build a little bit more consistency into that, into that dink. So think about following through a little bit higher This is a really important shot because in tennis, right, if you're behind in a point, 
what do you do, right? You throw up a high arc. That's how you get back into a point in, in tennis. In pickleball, you can't throw up a high arc, but you can throw up a higher and shorter dink, right? If I am out of position and I hit here, right, I'm in trouble. But if I'm out of position and I give it a little bit more arc, a little bit more loft, that's how I get myself into position. So it's kind of the same as tennis, where you want to give yourself a little bit more height when you're out of position. When you're nice and set up and you have an easier ball, sure, you can hit on that flat trajectory. But what I think you might be missing out on is that more defensive shot. When somebody has you in trouble, if you try to hit that flat shot, that flat dink, then you're more, you're more likely to put it into the net or pop it up. So trying to add, knowing when to add that, that little bit of arc is important. So let's try a couple more of those. It's really basic. It should almost feel like boring, right? But it's, it's an important shot. And it's, this is a shot that I actually use sometimes, right? When you're out of position, you need to get that ball arced up and over. So now let's do it this way. If you have an easier ball, right? Something you can do something with, go ahead, push it a little bit more, right? Try and move me around. But if you have, if I've moved you around, maybe then you want to give yourself a little bit more margin. Let's try it. I'll move you around both forehand and backhand side. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, not a good start. <laughs> Nice. Nice. There you go. That one was going to be the one that I say a little bit more arc because I had you moving, right? But you tried to go pretty low over that net. There you go, perfect. Nice, good margin. Oh. All right, so that's kind of a, a, just a shot selection thing, is understanding that not every dink needs to be an inch over the net, right? Just like in tennis, not every forehand or backhand is going an inch over the net. It's a lot easier to understand margin for error in tennis because you have such a large target. But here we still wanna do the same thing. On a tougher ball, we don't wanna aim an inch over the net. We wanna aim a foot over the net, but maybe we aim it shorter in the kitchen because sh the net protects us better the closer we are. Meaning like if I have a ball that's this height, I need to hit straight upwards to get it over the net. But if you hit it a little bit farther to me and I'm making contact from here, right, I can put some pace on it. So when you're hitting a little bit more defensively, we're gonna give ourselves more margin for error and a little shorter in the kitchen. All right, so that's a little bit of shot selection. One of the other things that I, that I saw is when you're using that two-handed backhand dink, um, you tend to be, you're a little bit loose with the wrists. And so sometimes it seems like you're not necessarily in kind of a more set and repeatable position. So one of the things that I used to do in tennis and one of the things that I like to do because I use, I'm trying to work on my two-handed backhand dink as well. The main part of a two-handed dink is your non-dominant hand, is your left hand here, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna dink with you 
except my right hand is doing almost nothing. Actually, let's just go lefty for a second. All right, set that paddle there. This might not be pretty. It won't be pretty for me either. But the key here is like, when you are hitting a backhand in tennis, right? They always say that that two-handed backhand stems from the left hand. Same is true here. Sorry. Ah. All right, now, now I want you to dink with your regular two hands, but see if you can make your right hand do almost nothing. It's still com almost completely left hand. Your right hand is a guide for your left arm here. Nice. There we go. It's looking good. This is good. What I was noticing before was when you were hitting some of those, it looked like you're maneuvering the wrists a little bit. Now, after that, lefty drill it looks like this is set as you're swinging more from the shoulders than you are from down here at the wrists it's looking good one more I'm gonna move you around a little bit now Ah, sometimes on that backhand, or on the backhand, you do a nice job of staying square to me, right? But on that forehand, I see sometimes you're crossing those legs, which not necessarily wrong, but it makes things a lot tougher. And it's probably better to, to try and get there with an, a more open stance on that forehand. So the reason why is, let me show you this. So one of the keys to hitting a good consistent dink is we don't want a big backswing, right? The problem is, come on, right up to this line. And now without moving your hands in relation to your body, right? I want you to step outwards here, right? See where your hands are? They're still in front of this line. Right now, I want you to, without moving your hands, step across. Now notice how your paddle is now behind this kitchen line. Yeah. Right. When we step across, our pat or our paddle. When we step across, our paddle comes with us. Right, and that tends to lead us to more pop-ups. When I come out here with an open stance, it's easy for me to keep this paddle in front of me and not take that backswing. Yeah. When I cross over, now I have way more play back there. So try and, try and keep open stance both ways. Ah, it's not easy, right? Because in tennis and when I'm at the baseline, I'm always like trying to close up the stance, right? But from here, there's a couple of reasons why we don't. First, you're more likely to pop the ball up because of your backswing. Second, once I cross over, I now have one, two, three recovery steps, right? As opposed to one step, right? So you're more likely to pop the ball up and you're more out of position 
as a result of it. So that's why a couple of reasons why we want to generally stay square to our opponent there. Hey, there you go. Oh, I tricked you though. Let's do the same thing but cross court, okay? I can move you around a little bit more cross court. Nice. There we go, like it. So, for a couple of these, what's the difference between what I was just doing and what you were doing? All right, take a look. This is the way, watch me for a sec. This is what I was doing. All right, now this is what you're doing. So the difference is I'm taking one sort of lunge, right? Getting into that open stance, you're making a, a, a total move completely, which if you're thinking about this from your tennis brain, right? That's a way better way of doing it is moving your feet more, right? In tennis, if this ball is coming right to me, I'm moving my feet like this, right? But in pickleball, it's not actually what you want. If you watch the best cross-court forehand dinkers, Simone comes to mind for me. She's such a rock solid player on that side. She's almost not moving her feet at all. From this spot, you can cut off almost anything. If I'm reaching in, I can cut the ball off. And if I can't, it's one lunge there. Sometimes, right, you'll know, okay, it's too far. I've got to actually move. But most of the time, we're cutting the ball off with one step here. So counterintuitive for me as a tennis player, but when we get there, I'm in better balance than if I'm trying to keep moving right until the last second. So I want you to get a little wider base here. See what you can do only moving that outside foot. There you go, see you instinctively, you knew that one I have to move, right? I was giving you some tougher ones before that, but you were still getting there in one step. You know when you gotta go, right? But now don't, don't, uh, don't shuffle too much. So weird to me as a tennis player, but less is more with your footwork in pickleball. Let's, let's hit a couple more dinks, okay? I wanna, I wanna see something. There you go. So one of the biggest things that I see with tennis players is, and it was something that took me forever to figure out, was difficulty with kind of those low volleys. In tennis, 
you know, when we get a, a low volley, a lot of times we'll either try and like work it with our strings a little bit, or we'll try and punch it deep. The margins aren't as thin in tennis as they are pickleball, right? In pickleball, we need to hit it into this seven foot window, right? Otherwise it's in the net or it's gonna be a, an attackable ball for me. One of the things that, that players don't account for is when we're hitting dinks, the ball is coming slow. When I hit that same dink to you, except it's coming out of the air, that ball is traveling. That ball has more energy as it hits your paddle than a dink does. When I hit you a, a ball and it hits the ground, the ball slows down as it hits the ground, right? But when I hit you a soft ball out of the air, the ball itself is carrying more energy. So when I'm hitting the ball off the bounce, I need to give the ball a little bit more energy. When I'm taking the ball out of the air, I don't need hardly anything, right? The ball is doing most of the work. Take a look. If I'm taking it out of the air, there's very, very little swing that I'm giving it. Almost nothing, right? When I'm dinking, I have to give that ball a little bit more energy. So we're gonna do one of my favorite drills, which is dink to volley. I'm gonna be working on my offensive dink shots. I'm gonna be aiming right for that kitchen line. You're gonna be looking to take the ball out of the air. So my target's gonna be somewhere around this step. You're working on taking that ball out of the air and you're working on taking the pace off of it. The easiest way to get pop-ups at I'd say the below four or five level is give them that dink volley, right? They'll pop it up or they'll put it in the net. So work on trying to give yourself a little bit more arc, taking the pace off and dumping that ball short. Nice. There it is. Ooh, that's a tough one. I made you reach for that one. Go ahead. Oh God. There you go. Nice. Perfect. There it is. Perfect. Hey, that was good. You missed it, but that was a good swing. All right. Now let's switch roles, okay? You're gonna work on your more offensive shot. I'm gonna work on my more defensive shot. See how little I'm kind of doing with that paddle? A little, too, too little, apparently. Oops, this is a drill that can be done all the different directions, but it's one of my favorites to just get you the feel between the two shots. It's not something that I ever, it took me a while to kind of consciously figure that out is the ball is giving you less when it's off the bounce than it is out of the air. Let's do, let's do a couple of volleys. So, you ready? I'm just gonna fire one at you. Ah, nice. Ooh. 
Oops, sorry. Ooh, nice. Like I said earlier, I over move, right, in pickleball. One of the things that I'm working on is in these quick exchanges, in tennis, no matter how hard that ball is hit at us when we're at the net, we usually have a time to take a step, get ourselves in position, even if they rope it at us. Here, we really don't. No matter how fast your feet are, your hands are gonna be faster, right? And so, generally, we wanna have kind of a nicer, base. It's, we're going to be a little out of balance when we're really kind of moving around a lot. Sometimes we have to, just like up at the kitchen line. Sometimes we have to go cross over or, or step out of our, our area to go get that ball. You'll know it when you feel it. Now, I want to see if we can do this volley drill, working on staying planted, right? Working on using our, we can shift a little bit, right? But not moving a tremendous amount because when we move around a bunch, then we get out of balance. It's tougher to track the ball, a ball when you're moving, right, than when you're stationary. So let's do a couple where we try and stay still. This will be good. If anybody's watching this, they're gonna say, Zane, you don't do that at all. What are you talking about? Like, okay, yeah, we'll do as I say, not as I do. I'm working at it, okay? I definitely move too much personally. So, all right, let's get a nice base here. There we go. That was our best rally yet. Sorry. No worries. I see one more thing. All right, let me see your ready position. Okay. Right now, right, your hands are pretty far out in front of you. It's pretty typical for tennis. In tennis, what are they, what's the first thing they tell you about volleying in tennis? Don't swing at your volleys, right? Here, we're allowed to. Here, we do kind of want to swing at our volleys. So the technique for tennis versus pickleball is different. In tennis, we're only blocking. Being far out in front of our body, that's great for blocking, right? But from here, I can't punch that ball, really. So before I played pickleball, I was a boxer. Did you know that? I'm just, I'm totally kidding, not at all. But if you think about boxing, right? They need to be able to both block punches and throw punches. So if they're out here, they might be able to block well. And if they're in here, they might be able to punch well, right? But from here, I can't block. From here, I can't punch. So I want to be somewhere in the, diff in the middle. Right now, you're in block mode, right? What I think about with ready position is having this elbow just maybe an inch or two in front of the body here. From this spot, I can block, and I can also punch. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nice, good stuff. Ah. Eh. Ah. One more. Ah, sorry. Good stuff, how does that, how does that feel? A little different, right? 
you have more from here, you can push, you can accelerate a little bit more instead of just being kind of defensive and, and blocking. So a little bit quieter on those feet and let the arms do more for you, right? Okay. All right, let's hit some third shot drops. What do you say? Let's do it. I like that answer, yes. Well, one of my favorite ways to work third shots is to have you start up at the kitchen line and then I'm gonna start to slowly push you back, okay? So we'll start out straight right here. Every time you hit a, a dink, take a tiny little step back, just like that. That'll be perfect. Ah, it's coming back at you. Ah, sorry. Oh, I almost got it in the hopper. Um, Chris, I think it'd be good if you got a couple of her paddle, how it's like very vertical. Um, take a look at that. Maybe a couple kind of close-ups over there especially on that forehand side. See how it's like pretty up and down? That's one of the things we're gonna change a little bit. I'll hit a couple backhands over there. One of the other things that I'm seeing is that paddle is kind of in motion right until the last second. Um, and I'm gonna work on that with her as well a little bit. I'm gonna give her a couple higher forehands so that it shows that it's a little tougher to do. So Lauren, one of the things that I, I see is, I feel like a lot of people are taught on third shot drops that it's like a throwing motion, right? Have you heard that before? Well, in some ways it is, right? When the ball is, is down low, right? We can throw like this. It looks just like a toss. But what if I have to, what if the ball is, what if I'm making contact up here, right? What am I supposed to do if I'm doing an underhand toss from this spot, right? So it's like a toss to a certain extent. When we can contact that ball down low, it's easy. It's like a toss. Those were solid. You were hitting those really nicely when they were down low. Where you struggled was when we started to get this ball in here. At a certain point, we can't hit, we can't do that tossing motion anymore, right? We need to let that ball come over to the side a bit more. I'm sorry, we need to let the paddle come over to the side a little bit more, right? And at a certain point, our paddle is up here, right? If somebody gives us a really easy ball, we might be up here hitting it like a tennis ground stroke. So what I want to do is I want to work that third shot drop, working on the on the side technique, right? Um, so I want you to think about having your paddle head above the level of the wrist on these, okay? So I'm gonna hit to your forehand. Let's do the same drill where you start to slowly back up, except keep that paddle above the level of the wrist. There you go. Nice. That one dropped down just a little bit.
Nice, one more. Bring that paddle up if it's, yeah, there you go. Nice, sorry. Oh! All right, couple backhands over there. Backhands looked good. All right, forehand looked a little bit better when we're not trying to do that, that more, that scoop shot. Once you kind of brought that paddle over to the side of you a little bit more, that was good. So for beginners, it's easy to say, hey, this is the first step, make this, this third shot like a toss. And that's fine when the ball is probably below waist level. You can do that, right? But then the problem is when it gets up a little bit higher, it gets very, very difficult to hit third shot drops with that toss. So we need to have that paddle over to the side. Backhand side looked pretty, pretty solid. The only thing I would say on that backhand side is kind of similar to what we were doing on the dink, where this is mostly coming from the left hand. What I was seeing was a little bit of, of um, kind of like the, the loose wrist, the, the using that right hand a little bit too much. Let that right hand be a guide and push towards me with that, that left hand a little bit. Let me, let's do a, just a couple more. Keep these kind of like left hand dominant here. Nice. Not as nice. <laughs> So occasionally as well, that paddle gets just a bit behind you on the backhand side, making it a little bit tougher to control the, um, to control the pace. Think about, same idea as, as when dinking, think about not letting that paddle get behind you, right? When I'm hitting those, I don't hit too many two-handed drops, but when I do, it's pretty compact. It's mostly just a push forwards. Right? I don't, need, I don't need the power that comes from that backswing there, right? Unless I'm hitting a drive, but that's a different story. Let's so try and keep that backhand in front of you a little bit more. Ah, oh, sorry. Let me push you back to that baseline a little bit here. There you go. Keep that paddle out in front of you. Nice. Ooh. Nice. One more. Give it a little bit more lift. There you go. Now rein it in with the depth. More lift, less power. There you go. Perfect. Nice. All right, there are two ways to get a ball to go farther, right? You can hit harder or you can hit at a higher arc, right? So when we 
re when we t stop taking the swing back, right? Yeah. Well, when I'm starting my swing here instead, yeah. I'm losing my power, mm -hmm. right? So as a result, we need to give ourselves more arc, okay. right? So we're taking away power, but we're giving ourselves more arc. Just like imagine that that's our basket in basketball, yeah. right? If you shoot your, your basket on a flat trajectory, it's never going to go in. We need to have some arc on our shot to get that ball to land in the kitchen. Okay. On that backhand side, we changed from getting our distance from power yeah. to now we have to get our distance from lift. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. It was looking, looking a little bit better once you started giving yourself height on that. Yeah. Height is margin, yeah. right? So. Yeah. It was good. So uh, a couple of the different things that we spoke about today was using that one-handed backhand sometimes because it gives you a little bit more reach, um, understanding what you can and can't do with the ball. If I hit you a tough shot, you need to give yourself a little bit more arc even on a, on a dink shot. When you're using that two-handed backhand, really your dominant hand is just a guide. The, the real power and the real control is coming from this left hand. The right hand is just here to kind of be a guide. Um, on that forehand side and on, on both sides, we want to try and remain square to the net when we can. Yeah. Um, it's great that you were moving your feet, but less is more in pickleball. If you can get there with one lunge instead of getting out of position with two or crossing over, that's ideal. Um, let's see, we also talked about the dink to volley. When, I hit, when you're taking a ball out of the air, the ball is giving you more energy. So you need to even compact your swing more. If I'm hitting a dink, it might look like that, right? But if I'm taking it out of the air, it might only be there. Um, and just that drill, getting the feel for that is the biggest thing. When we talked about volleying to volley, when we're both hitting, um, we talked about not having happy feet. We'll be in better balance if we're kind of grounded um, our hands move faster than our feet. And then we also talked about my boxing career for a little bit. We don't want to be super far out because we can't punch. We don't want to be super far in because we, don't, we can't block from there. So we want to split the difference and I think have that ready position about an inch or two in front of the body. And then finally we talked about those third shot drops. We need to give ourselves a little bit of arc. They're pretty similar to our, our dink shot, but um, we don't want to be scooping these. It works if the ball is down low, but once the ball gets up a little bit higher, we need to hit, take this shot from our side. So this is an easy tool to teach a beginner that it's just like a toss, but that tops out at a, at a higher level. So lots of good stuff to work on. Well,